All right, in today's lesson, uh, we're gonna start talking about the development of behaviorism. And uh, last lesson, we talked about applied psychology and behaviorism becomes another source of applied psychology. It becomes another uh, theoretical approach to studying psychology. Now, you're gonna see that at the bottom of the slide, it says behaviorism part one because this is going this is going to be in two separate lectures so the goal of today is to cover um chapters nine and ten so this gives you an idea of the backdrop of behaviorism and then the early stages of behaviorism and then next class we'll uh cover in lecture 10 the the uh current state of behaviorism and psychological theory. So uh, let's talk about uh, what's happening. Where, how does behaviorism come about? Well, in the 1910s to the 1920s, there becomes a debate amongst the leading theorists about what psychology should focus on. You had people like Sigmund Freud talking about the unconscious and studying things that are happening beneath the surface. You had Wilhelm Wundt talking about sensation and perception and the use of introspection as a, um, a way of studying psychology or, or the mental states. You had Titchener talking about mental elements, but all of these approaches were not directly observable. And at this point, you have John Watson, which we'll talk about, uh, write a paper, Psychology as a Behaviorist Sees It. And that paper in 1913 was a direct statement that no, psychology should focus on that which is observable. So here we go. So let's talk a little bit about Watson's version of psychology or Watson's behaviorism. He wanted it to be more scientific in nature. Uh, he felt that uh, people like uh, Sigmund Freud, they, they talked about things related to the mind, but they weren't very measurable. So he felt that psychology should focus exclusively on uh, observable acts or observable behavior. Uh, this way it's less subjective. It should be a, an objective description of behavior and anything related to consciousness, the mind, sensation, uh, these are out. And he said uh, the unconscious is analogous to the soul. Just like you cannot physically measure a soul, you cannot measure what's going on in uh, the unconscious. So uh, clear attack on what's happening uh, beneath the surface. Now he was also promoting existing ideas. So it wasn't like this came out of nowhere. So Watson, his ideas came out of uh, objectivism which we, and mechanism, which we talked about in lecture two. His ideas come out of animal psychology and comparative psychology, which is starting to blossom, and functional psychology, which we talked about from William James. Uh, but here's the deal. Uh, he understood that we need an objective science. If we're going to see psychology as a, a scientific discipline, it cannot be speculative. So you need to focus on objective points. So here are some foundational philosophers that add value to this. So the person, Rene Descartes, uh, he talks about mechanistic tendencies in the body we talked about that as well in lecture two. Uh, August Comte talked about positivism, which is 
trying to focus on undisputable, undebatable facts. And that becomes the spirit of the times or the zeitgeist. And long story short, in Watson's behaviorism, we are just sophisticated machines, human beings. Now, Watson talks about um, behavior as being a direct outgrowth of animal, animal behavior and studies in animal behavior. So people like Darwin and evolutionary theory uh, become quite important and uh, having a continuum from the uh, non-human animal and the human animal and the way we think also became quite important. Now, he also was influenced by Morgan, Lloyd Morgan or Morgan's Canon or the law of parsimony, the idea that make as few assumptions as possible uh, and that's usually the most correct uh, outcome. Along comes Jacques Loeb, and he talks about working towards objectivity in animal research. So one thing he started to study was tropism, which is an involuntary uh, forced movement, and sort of like a reflexive response. And he argued that because there are these trope or tropisms that you don't need consciousness for animal behavior. And in, in many ways, um, animals respond in a reflexive way or in a hardwired way uh, that they don't need to be taught, so to speak. So now, did he entirely reject consciousness? The answer is no. And he felt that there was this idea of associative memory where a memory is a cognitive process, right? So how did that work? It worked based on linking stimuli or triggers in your environment with behavioral responses. And uh, that demonstrates some level of consciousness. So then we have Yerkes. Again, Yerkes we talked about in terms of the army alpha and beta test, but he's also uh, responsible for doing research on animals and trying to uh, look for similarities and differences between humans and animals. So that comparative psychology. So once again, linking human animals to non-human animals. Willard Stanton Small created the rat maze as a test of of uh, mental uh, ideas or terms. And then, as we said, there's John Watson, who started off his work uh, interested in cognition, right? And then he shifted away from cognition. So in 1903, he, John Watson writes his dissertation, Animal Education, the Psychical Development of the White Rat. Um, 1907, he talks about conscious experience and sensation in rats. Uh, then we have Charles Henry Turner, who studies ant behavior. And um, ultimately, that uh, becomes the foundation for the term behavior or behaviorism. Now, Turner was um, influenced by uh, pardon me, Watson was influenced by Turner's research and that's when he started to use the, Turner, uh, the term behaviorism. Um, other facts at this point about Charles Henry Turner, um, he was one of the early African-American psychologists, uh, started doing his PhD in zoology um, and then switched over to psychology but because he was African-American and this was the early 1900s, uh, he struggled to gain opportunity um, and faced much discrimination. Yeah. Then we have Margaret Floyd Washburn, which we heard about in the previous uh, lectures. Uh, 
Uh, she was one of Titchener's students. She taught animal psychology at Cornell and wrote the book, The Animal Mind. And that becomes the first comparative psychology text published in the United States. She focuses on consciousness. Um, she used the uh, approach of introspection by analogy. And the argument was that um, animals had the same mental processes that human beings had. Now there are criticisms to the method of introspection by analogy. That is to say that's anthropomorphism. So be mindful that there are not, not everybody agreed to her approach. So here we are talking about behaviorism, but it seems like I'm giving you a lecture on comparative psychology, talking about the relationship between animals and humans. And the answer for that is that's because uh, behaviorism puts a heavy emphasis on animal research. But in the early 1900s, comparative psychologists didn't receive the same level of funding that they do today. In fact, uh, Harvard's president said, there's no future to Yerkes comparative psychology. And uh, ultimately he was advised to take up educational psychology and the same thing, uh, his students also took up applied uh, psychology jobs because comparative psychology was relatively uh, discarded at this point in history. Um, and if you needed to cut, do budget cuts, comparative psychologists were um, the first to go. And that's why people started to focus on the kind of aspects of applied psychology that you could get a job. Now it's interesting that with so few comparative psychologists, the discipline does continue and ultimately it blossoms. Uh, but really when we look at the early 1900s, comparative psychology was heavily criticized. It didn't get the supporting that it needed. Um, we do get a journal that comparative psychologists can publish in 1911 called the Journal of Animal Behavior, which eventually gets renamed as the Journal of Comparative Psychology that creates some kind of shift. We also see uh, Pavlov's work on classical conditioning gets reprinted in the journal Science, which makes a big deal. Right? Because here now we're starting to see some value in animal research. We also see um, a description of Pavlov's work once again that happens and it's published in Psychological Bulletin. Again, putting more awareness um, on the idea of comparative psychology or animal research. All right. So let's talk about um, animal research. There was a famous case called Clever Hans, uh, the clever horse. Now Clever Hans uh, was a horse that they believed was intelligent, that had the capacity to do addition, subtraction, had the capacity to do memory tests by either tapping his hoof or nodding his head. Now his owner, Wilhelm von Osten, showed Clever Hans off, showed the horse off, and his whole goal was to say, see, animals are smart, animals have mental processes like human beings, and the only difference between animals and humans are that animals aren't educated, and if they were educated, they would show higher levels of mental abilities and cognition, um, than they do now. So, you know, Von Osten would take his horse and bring him to as, you know, many public displays as possible. He would show his horse off and he was very, very proud of his horse. So the government thought that this was a little bit suspicious and they 
were tr trying to prove that Von Osten was a fraud. So they hired uh, Stumpf, which was a phenomenologist at this point, to investigate. And Stumpf uh, basically could not find any incidents of fraud or deceit. So what happens next is interesting. They go about this through an experimental approach. Stumpf said, I'm not really seeing fraud, but let's look at this further. So Stumpf had a student by the name of Funks. Uh, you couldn't make up these names, I tell you. Um, and Funks decided to investigate further. And what he did was he tried to study this using an experimental process in which in one scenario, the group had the correct answers. And then he tested the horse in another group that did not have the correct answers. And what did he find? He found that the horse, Hans got the answer correct only in the group that knew the correct answer. So what does that mean? What's the conclusion? It must be that the horse was receiving visual cues from the questioner or the audience. And um, what would happen is if the questioner looked up or the audience leaned forward, they would give some kind of audio visual cue that that's when the horse should stop tapping. And the horse learned that. Whereas in the condition where they didn't know the correct answer, the horse didn't get it right. So what does this tell you? Uh, on one level, it tells you from an experimental psychology point of view, the importance of being very careful uh, so that you don't introduce experiment or bias into your work. On another level, I'm going to argue this actually shows that Hans the horse was actually fairly clever. The horse was actually intelligent. Now, just because Hans didn't really know how to add or subtract or the memory processes that were attributed to him were incorrect, uh, doesn't mean that he wasn't smart. He was still learning from his environment and the cues that were provided. Now, I will tell you that Von Osten was fairly disheartened by this. And he, he, he became very, very sad um, and never looked at his horse the same way. But, you know, that's a shame because, you know, it just shows another form of intelligence. All right, so the next person in early behaviorism that I wanna talk to you about is Thorndike. Edward Thorndike, uh, he was a um, behaviorist, but he was at Columbia University, which I'll talk to you about. Um, and he actually has some controversial elements, which we'll talk to him as we go through. So in general, what was Thorndike, his view? Well, he operated from an objective mechanistic theory of learning, which was very common in early behaviorism. He wanted to focus on directly observable or overt behavior, um, although he had some flexibility about mental processes. And he uh, comes up with the concept of the law of effect, which basically suggests that behaviors that result in the desirable outcome are continued whereas behaviors that don't result in a desirable outcome are discontinued. Now, interesting to note, Pavlov also came up with a similar concept called the law of reinforcement, but nevertheless, these two terms are interchangeable. So Thorndike becomes the first psychologist who received all of his psychological training in the United States. You may recall in uh, the last lecture, I talked about the first generation of American psychologists went to Germany and they were trained under Wundt. Well, um, 
Thorndike becomes the first psychologist to receive all of his training in the United States. Interesting, uh, he was inspired by William James and James's book, The Principles, which was the first psychological textbook. And eventually he studied with him. Uh, he wanted to do research uh, with children, but that was prohibited uh, based on uh, some scandal around a researcher who uh, was taking vitals loose in clothing and it was uh, interpreted as an impropriety. Um, also inspired by Morgan. So he starts studying chicks uh, for research and would ultimately leave Harvard uh, without a PhD. Uh, so even though he studied under William James, he didn't get his PhD from Harvard. He ultimately gets his PhD from Columbia University in New York City studying under Cattell and his dissertation focused on animal intelligence. And, and that in his uh, study he used both cats and dogs. He would shift gears to focusing on other species, but um, it, you know, that became his reputation, even though um, he shifted gears. So he, he shifts gears, does research at Columbia University, becomes part of their faculty in 1899, and his primary focus becomes educational psychology and mental testing, which should not be shocking to you, right? Because a lot is happening in Pennsylvania, New York City, around educational psychology and psychological testing. So um, again, he operates based on a principle of connectionism, uh, which links a stimulus and a response, um, highly influenced by Romanus and Morgan. Um, at this point, he used mentalistic terms, uh, but did not give the same level of cognition or consciousness to animals. Um, so Thorndike is someone who uh, studied uh, mental processes in animals. But after Thorndike, there's going to be a shift away from consciousness and a shift towards pure experimentation. And then everything becomes boiled down to SR learning or stimulus response learning. But let's talk about Thorndike's puzzle box. This is probably one of the more famous studies uh, where he was trying to see whether or not animals learn through flashes of insight or whether it was through trial and error learning. And so he built what were called puzzle boxes, but they're really peach crates. So they're rectangular crates and it had a, uh, a, pull, a pulley, a lever, and ultimately if you press the lever, it would lift the gate and it would open the gate and then the animal could get out of the peach crate. So uh, he did this with cats and he wanted to see, well, um, how many errors did they make? Uh, how much time it took? For them to solve the puzzle box and if you put them back in what once they got out would they immediately go back to the solution or was it trial and error so what he found was that he found no evidence of flashes of insight rather uh the cats learned through trial and error learning and even though they got out they didn't immediately pick up on, well, what resulted in me getting out? So they tried the things and things that consistently worked were stamped in. So uh, the successful responses got locked in or repeated. And the unsuccessful responses that didn't result in getting out of the peach uh, crates uh, 
he stopped doing and that's stamping out. So they're stamping in, stamping out and trial and error learning. So in the end, he believed that there was accidental success. Now, if you look here is a picture of Thorndike's, Thorndike's puzzle boxes and uh, the string and the rod that would lift uh, and ultimately the gate that would open up. And if there were flashes of insight, if you look on the left graph, uh, the amount of time once you figure out how to should drop immediately. But because it was smooth and gradual, that's why he suggested that learning happens through trial and error, not insight learning. Now, stamping in, stamping out gets shifted into the concept of the law of effect, which uh, acts that result in desirable outcomes are repeated and uh, vice versa. Eventually, he shifts the term law of effect to the law of exercise or law of use and disuse. Long story short, use it or lose it. And the kind of acts you do more often result in reinforcement, typically. All right. So where are we? At this point, this becomes the beginning of learning and behaviorism or learning theory. So he wanted to know how animals learn. Um, he was highly objective and influenced behaviorism very strongly. Um, ultimately, he gets lots of tributes, including Pavlov and Watson, who are responsible for classical conditioning in animals and humans, and the American psychologist honored his work in 1998. But what isn't highlighted in this work is uh, some of his implicit prejudicial and explicit prejudicial um, attitudes. In fact, uh, I guess it was last year, there was a controversy around Thorndike because there was more and more evidence that accrued that he engaged in sexism, racism, and anti-Semitism, including a test that he created that could screen real intelligence versus those people faking to be intelligent which was targeted towards Jewish enrollment at Columbia and resulted in a drop off by 50%. So uh, highly infallible, um, highly, pardon me, highly flawed individual, um, but nevertheless, one of the leading pioneers of behaviorism. Then we have Pavlov. Most people know Pavlov because of classical conditioning. Uh, Here's a little bit of his life. Initially, he was looking to become a priest. Uh, then he reads Darwin's work and becomes more interested in animal physiology. U ultimately, he becomes part of the Soviet intelligence or Russian intelligence movement. And his whole life, he became very absorbed into his research. Now, Pavlov would eventually win the Nobel Prize, so his work and his emphasis on the research actually paid off. Um, his wife focused on the mundane issues. Uh, it's interesting that he was described a lot as a space cadet, so uh, he would work and forget to collect his pay. Um, most of us wouldn't forget to collect our pay. Um, he struggled purchasing clothes and he was so in his own world. At one time he stepped out of a moving streetcar, broke his leg. Um, now, despite his devotion to his research, uh, he had a lot of help. Um, and some of his help came from his grad students. He delegated things. By 1890, uh, he gets a professorship in pharmacology in St. Petersburg. Uh, this helps him sh heavily with uh, finances. Uh, he was progressive in his day. He included 
uh, groups that were excluded oftentimes. Um, he allowed women and Jewish students to work in his laboratory and he fought against anti-Semitism and expressed anger anytime there was any hint of it. Uh, and by 1904, he wins the Nobel Prize for digestion, not psychology. So those of you who are like, oh, Pavlov was a psychologist, he actually was not. He was a medical doctor who focused on the vagus nerve. So what were his three research areas? Uh, coronary nerves, digestive glands, and then condition reflex, which is the focus for us. We were interested as psychologists in reflex. So the question is uh, whether or not reflexes are biologically driven or whether we can learn to behave based on making association between stimuli and responses. So as he was studying digestion and digestive glands, he created a tube that would measure the amount of saliva that uh, was secreted. Uh, and obviously uh, salivation is the first step towards digestion because uh, saliva as enzymes that helps break down food. Uh, but what he found was that these dogs would start to salivate even without food, which was not what you would expect, right? If you put food on the tongue or you take a bite out of a sandwich, sure, you're supposed to salivate. That makes sense. But the dogs started to salivate even before food was put in their mouth. Um, whether they saw the food or whether they heard uh, the footsteps of the feeders, eventually uh, they learned to associate the sound of the footsteps with receiving food. And these findings were very curious to Pavlov. This is according to his mindset, if it was a reflex, a reflex it should have been biologically driven and there was no biological trigger. So uh, what does he do? He tries to explore this further. Now, and I'll explain his Tower of Silence and ultimately classical conditioning in a minute, how he further explores this. But originally, he believed psychical reflexes were conditioned reflexes. Um, and he felt that there were these uh, unconditioned responses, which we would call reflexive in nature. Now, so what does he do? His first experiments, he showed a dog bread in his hand. Then he put the bread in the mouth. The dog starts to salivate, obviously, because that's normal, right? That's a, um, a automatic response to an unconditioned stimulus, food usually results in salivation to help break down, um, salivation helps break down the bread or the food. The dog eats, but eventually the dog started to salivate just by seeing the bread. Now here is some of the apparatus. This shows you the dog harnessed on the table, the screen that was put in front of the dog and the secretion tube to measure the saliva on his, the dog's cheek. But if, if um, Pavlov was gonna argue that there's learning that takes place and salivation just doesn't happen as a reflexive response, he had to address confounds, had to address outside factors that could be influencing his results. So what does he do? He erects the Tower of Silence. And the Tower of Silence were specially designed cubicles where the dog would not see the experimenter. So the anticipatory cues were not there. However, he was still worried about uh, control, so uh, controlling outside factors, so eventually, he takes a three-story building, he designs, 
and creates this tower of silence at extra thick windows, airtight doors, uh, steel girders, um, straw filled moat. Uh, and all of this was designed to eliminate any uh, extra sensory stimulation, whether it be temperature, sound, uh, touch, vibration, etc. So he really controlled the environment. And then he, he starts to do his condition experiment where uh, he presents a light and then presents food. The dog salivates. Now in the beginning, is it the light that results in salivation? The answer is no, right? It's the food that leads to salivation. But after repeated exposure, the light flashes, the food's presented, the light flashes, the food's pre presented. Eventually he learns, uh, he being the dog or the organism learns that the, the light results in presentation of the food. So he creates an association and that's associative learning, pairing the conditioned stimulus CS with the unconditioned stimulus US uh, so uh, that's learning. All right. So let's talk about the classical conditioning paradigm, also known as respondent conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning, because classical conditioning is when you pair two stimuli together. Now you're going to have two stimuli. So I'm going to go out of order of the slide and explain those. The unconditioned stimulus is a biologically significant stimulus, something like food, naturally biologically elicits an unconditioned response, right? So it's automatic response. The conditioned stimulus is something that's neutral. So in the previous slide, when we talked about the light flashing, light flashing has nothing to do with food. So, uh, then he would link them together, called the conditioning phase, and uh, ultimately it becomes a conditioned stimulus because you learn to use it as an anticipatory cue. Now, the unconditioned response is a biologically or reflexive response, an unlearned response. A conditioned response is a learned response due to it uh, the conditioned stimulus being linked to the unconditioned stimulus. So here's a scenario. Before conditioning, you present alpo to the dog. You present food, the dog's gonna salivate. You ring uh, a tuning fork, uh, dog's not gonna salivate, right? Because it has nothing to do with food. But during the conditioning phase, by the way, in behaviorism, the word conditioning oftentimes refers to learning. So during the conditioning phase, now you pair the tuning fork um, with the food. And at that point, there, the association starts to happen. The tuning fork or tone becomes a predictor of the food, the dog starts to salivate. But what during the conditioning phase, it's not clear, is the dog salivating due to the food like before conditioning, or is the dog salivating due to the tuning fork uh, after conditioning? Well, we don't know. The only way to do that is to remove the food and only present the tuning fork. So the post conditioning or after conditioning, you just present the tuning fork and if the dog salivates, we say learning took place. And sure enough, in Pavlov's study, that's exactly what happened. And the concept of classical conditioning was born. So very important to understand that it's SS learning or stimulus stimulus learning when you're pairing the two stimuli together. What would happen if you presented the food first and then the tuning fork? That's called backwards chaining or reverse, uh, reversing the stimuli together and learning does not take place that way. Now, Let's say you wanted to decondition 
this association. That's the process called extinction. Here you would present the uh, conditioned stimulus, but not present the unconditioned stimulus. So in the previous study, ring the tuning fork, don't present food, the dog might salivate. You ring the tuning fork, don't present food, the dog might salivate a, salivate a little bit less. Eventually you ring the tuning fork and the dog stops salivating altogether. This is what we call extinction. All right. Now, did the dog forget the association between the tuning fork and the food? Or did the dog learn a new principle? We argue that the dog learned a new set of principles and that's demonstrated through the concept of spontaneous recovery. If the dog forgot, then never again when you ring the tuning fork will it elicit, elicit salivation. What do we find? If you take some time off and then you ring the tuning fork, the dog starts to salivate again. And the fact that the dog salivates again demonstrates that the dog didn't forget. And that's called spontaneous recovery. Again, here's just another picture of that. We also have stimulus generalization and stimulus discrimination. Stimulus generalization is to get the conditioned response due to things that are similar to the conditioned stimulus. And we'll, we'll explain the Little Albert study, but that, that is an example of stimulus generalization. Stimulus discrimination is when you don't get um, the condition response because you're able to distinguish or discern that the condition stimulus is different from whatever other stimuli you're presenting. Now, uh, we talk about Pavlov, uh, but truth be told is Twitmer was also talking about reflexes as well. In fact, he did his dissertation on reflexes, gave presentations at APA, uh, but largely his findings were ignored. So the question is, why is it that Pavlov gets more credit for these reflexes than Twitmer? Answer is fairly simple. Well, Twitmer uh, had less experience when he presented. Uh, he presented before lunch, didn't give people um, time to ask questions. And ultimately, because of this, maybe he didn't get the credit he deserved. All right. Now, in terms of Pavlov, uh, he continued to study higher mental processes. Um, but in terms of physiological terms, cutting out consciousness altogether. Um, all right. Now, Bekhterev. Bekhterev is another uh, individual who was studying uh, classical conditioning. So uh, he focused, uh, in general, psychologists, he, um, very in, interested in objective psychology, not subjective psychology, uh, similar to Pavlov, welcomed women and Jews in his lab. He gets his MD and then ultimately studies under Wundt in Germany, uh, goes to St. Petersburg, and he is uh, working on the same kind of research as Pavlov. Now, Bakhtarev comes up and he founds his Psychoneurological Institute. He writes, writes a book, and then Pavlov slams Bakhtarev's book. Uh, and that results in them becoming enemies for, for life, uh, insulting each other, uh, challenging each other's uh, work uh, at conventions and so forth. But there, it's clear that these two individuals uh, felt competition amongst one another um, as it relates to uh, classical conditioning. So Bechter focused more on muscular responses, whereas Pavlov uh, focus more on glandular responses. All right. 
So uh, 1927, he dies. Uh, and some suggest that maybe Bekhterev was assassinated. And you might say, well, why? Well, he goes to see Sta Stalin and he diagnoses him with paranoia and then he winds up dead. Uh, and then ultimately uh, Stalin suppresses Bekhterev's work and has his son executed as well. So it, we believe that maybe Bekhterev was executed but in 1952, as some form of corrective measure, uh, the Soviet Union create, put out a, a postage stamp in Bekhterev's honor. So uh, again, Bekhterev was interested in associated reflexes. Uh, so not only things that could be uh, elicited by an unconditioned stimulus, but um, might have been associated with the unconditioned stimulus. Now I mentioned that he was interested in motor response or muscle responses, whereas Pavlov was more interested in glandular responses. And ultimately they both say very similar things, right? So um, he demonstrated that one would pull their hand back, not just by electrical shock, but the buzzer that sounded like the electrical shock that came afterwards. Uh, what was his view on thought processes? So um, he thought thought processes were more reflexes uh, and these were uh, inner actions of speech muscles. So uh, if we were talking, that's a behavior, right? So thought was subconscious vocalisms or behaviorism. So it depended on the interactions of speech muscles. And this was ad also adopted by Watson. Um, and, but by the, by the time of 1907, Becker of rejects uh, mental processes altogether and talks about objective psychology. He also felt that uh, animal research was highly controversial. He protested against surgeries that resulted in uh, cruelty to animal. Um, and in terms of um, animal rights, the animal rights movement starts to happen around this time. So you have 1824, the uh, SPCA is formed, 1866 in America, the ASPCA is formed. Um, and yeah, so that's that. And then you see all the different um, people who supported animal research uh, and then all the people who uh, were targeted as a function of that by the ASPCA. All right, so what was the influence of functional psychology on behaviorism? Well, it became more objective than other schools of thought. Um, for a while it was called objective psychology uh, and it called for a focus on directly observable behavior and rejected introspection. So uh, in 1904, Cattell emphasizes pure objectivity. Anything that resulted in introspection was out and Watson did the same thing when he spoke at the World's Fair. Um, Angel, which is another um, psychologist, he says in 1910, psychology is ready to be more objective rather than subjective. Um, and then by 1930, he says, ideally we would just forget about consciousness altogether um, and just focus on behavior of humans and animals, which is a, a very powerful statement when you think about it because it's, it's suggesting us do an about face uh, away from the founding direction of Wundt and Titchener. So, and then Pillsbury, which was one of Titchener's students, defined psychology as the study of behavior. So now let's talk a little bit about Watson. Who was John Watson? Well, John Watson was born in 1878 and he lived to 1958. Uh, he was a rambunctious fellow, um, exhibited some 
quote unquote delinquent behavior as a child. Um, but ultimately he thought he was going to become a minister. And he did that because his mom requested he become a minister. So he enrolls in Furman University, starts uh, studying philosophy, math, Greek, uh, enrolls in the Princeton Theological Seminary, um, and by 1990 he earns his master's degree at Furman, and then his mother uh, passes away, and then he asks to be released from his vow to become clergy, and that's what he does. By 1900, he goes to the University of Chicago. Uh, University of Chicago is a uh, developing uh, school of thought, as a, in fact, you may hear the term Chicago school. Um, he went to Chicago and uh, he wanted to study and get a psychology degree, a PhD from the University of Chicago. And originally, uh, he wanted to study under Dewey, uh, but Dewey seemed to be very abstract and dense in how he spoke. So he shifted away and, you know, focused on Angel's work and worked with Loeb. And eventually he gets his uh, PhD from the University of Chicago. Um, actually, he was fairly young, right? So he was 25 years old when he got his PhD making him the youngest person to get a PhD in that school's history at that time. Uh, he studies neuro neurolo neurological functioning and psychological functioning in the white rat and um, works there. What's interesting is that he had his insecurities. Uh, Helen Bradford uh, uh, Thompson Woolley was also at the University of Chicago and um, he was told that his work wasn't as good as hers, and he feel, felt threatened by that. So introspective methods, he wasn't good at either. So he, he focused much more on the objective approach to psychology and starts to push uh, objective psychology. Now, in 1908, he gets a professorship at John Hopkins University uh, he he kind of was reluctant to leave the University of Chicago, but it came with a promotion, money, his own laboratory, and so forth, so he does. Now, um, Watson took James Mark Baldwin's job. Now, um, it's interesting. Now, Baldwin created... The, the journal Psychological Review, but in 1909 was forced to resign because he was caught coming out of a brothel. Um, so ultimately, um, Watson would take his job and 11 years later uh, would be forced to resign because he had an affair with one of his grad students. So Watson becomes the editor of Psychological Review. He presents some um, concepts of objective psychology at Columbia University where Thorndike is. And his famous paper, which put the flag in the ground uh, and started the fight uh, between the different schools of thought was his paper, Psychology as a Behaviorist Season. So in this paper, he explains what behaviorism is, what the goals of behaviorism is, um, and he criticizes structuralism. So that's criticizing Flint and Titchener. He criticizes functionalism. So that's criticizing William James. And he said, everything can be linked down to heredity and habit. So applied psychology must, uh, become more objective, must become more standardized, and must become more uniform for it to continue. 1914, he writes uh, Behavior and Introduction to Comparative Psychology. Now keep in mind, he's not the first person um, who, who talks about comparative psychology because Darwin was doing this as well, but um, he, this, this 
manuscript was responsible for increasing support for understanding animal psychology, trying to see the advantages of it, uh, and it shifts us away from philosophical uh, speculation. Um, in terms of practical application, he starts doing research with children. And 1919, as I said, he writes the paper, Psychology from the Standpoint of a Behaviorist, which uh, summarizes the state of behaviorism and psychology. Um, in 1920, he was forced to resign from John Hopkins University because, as I mentioned, um, he wound up having an affair with a grad student, Rosalie Rayner. And what's interesting is Rosalie Rayner worked with Watson on the famous Little Albert study. Now, how did, he, how did it happen that he was um, forced to resign? Well, in those days, you know, grad students would spend a lot of time with their faculty. They would even go uh, over their house. And for several years, Rosalie was sort of like a house guest of, of the Watsons. And they would write love letters back and forth. And eventually Watson's wife of the time finds these love letters and publish excerpts in the Baltimore Sun, calling attention to his infidelity and ultimately, he's asked to leave from John Hopkins University. Um, and then he becomes um, banished, really, or kind of a pariah, so to speak. Um, so you would say, well, karma has it, serves him right, all of these things. But that's not the end of Watson's career. So he starts an advertising career and becomes very, very wealthy. Uh, he starts uh, developing in consumer psychology, right? So when we talked about industrial organizational psychology, his principles uh, become useful. So he highlights the power of psychology in mainstream culture uh, as well. And um, 1928, he writes Psychological Care of the Infant and Child, which gives objective uh, guidance on how to parent your child, have more regulated upbringing, um, and has a significant impact. 1935, um, his wife passes away. By 1957, he gets uh, an APA citation for his contributions to science. Um, he couldn't accept it, actually he passes away um, a year later, but um, he actually has his son accept the award on his behalf. Um, and then, you know, sort of as a cathartic experience, he burns all of his papers before he passes away. So what was the reaction to Watson's program of research? His, Watson's major points was psychology should study behavior. It should be purely objective. It should be part of the natural sciences. Uh, studying the human animal versus the non-human animal didn't matter as much to him. Both animals and humans should be studied. Anything related to mentalism should be uh, replaced with behaviorism. And the whole purpose of behavior behaviorism was to predict and control behavior. Um, initially, he wasn't well received, right? So, um, but the, the 1919 book, Psychology from a Standpoint of a Behaviorist, have resulted in greater support. Um, now, uh, when we talk about Calkins and Washburn, they did not receive his work well. They called him the enemy of psychology. Uh, and Calkins thought introspection was the sole uh, approach. Now, in the 1920s, things change. We start to see university courses on behaviorism. We start to see the term behaviorist in journals. Uh, McDougall uh, in the 1920s says, be careful. Uh, with behaviorism's popularity. 
Titchener started to complain about this because he was all about introspection. Um, and then other forms of behaviorism start to emerge. So how do you measure behavior according to this model? Only objective methods are allowed. So observation, whether it be with or without instrument, directly observable observation, testing verbal report, and measuring condition reflexes all are part of the process. Verbal reports, um, in terms of verbal reports, he said that's legitimate for psychophysics and really speech reactions are observable and thought was merely covert speech. Now, this opened him up for criticism because he can't have it both ways because language actually is a cognitive process and he eventually admits that um, verbal reports, you know, have less precision. So in terms of the condition reflex method uh, that was adopted in 1915, uh, Watson was responsible for the wide, its widespread use with the, uh, with, pardon me, Watson was responsible for its widespread use in the United States uh, and so forth. So what should we study? We should study the elements of behavior, instincts, emotions. Uh, he talked about little Albert and thought. So these are the things. So let's talk about the elements of behavior. The goal is to understand overall behavior of the total organism. And if you want to understand the total organism, everything could be boiled back down to a, a stimulus which occurs in the environment and a response to that stimulus, which is a behavior. So long story short, uh, everything gets boiled down to behaviors. So what's the difference between a response and an act? A response is a simple behavior and an act is a complex set of behaviors. Things like dancing are acts because they're very complex, but even acts which are complex can be broken down to motor activities and glandular responses, depending on what we're talking about. He also wanted to talk about explicit versus implicit responses. So an explicit response is directly observable behavior, whereas an implicit response is something that happens inside of the person. Now, even if it happens inside of a person, there has to be an observable response that happens as a function of that. So if, in, let's say in Pavlov's study, he secreted saliva, the, the dog. That happens because of a neurological and neural impulse, but you, could, you can't see the neurological impulse, but you can see the secretion, which is a behavioral output of something that's more implicit. Simple versus complex stimuli, again, so it's exactly what it it sounds like it and it's fairly similar to what you've learned earlier in the semester simple stimuli are exactly that basic um trigger something like a light wave would be a simple stimulus a complex stimulus is a combination of stimuli but still can be reduced into more simple or elemental stimuli now what Watson believed is that behaviors have to be identified through the principle of stimulus response complexes and that was fairly lawful, right? Meaning you're looking for laws of behavior. What about instincts? Instincts, things that are wired. Um, 1914 Watson suggests that um, we have 11 instincts and he he wanted to prove this to be the case, so he does research on aquatic birds. And Carl Lashley, which is another famous uh, neurological or biological psychologist, works with him on this. They go on an expedition, but he cuts it short because they ran out of uh, cigarettes and whiskey, which is interesting to tell you his character. But by 1925, uh, he cuts out the concept of instincts as well, 
and becomes uh, a purely environmentalist. So no inherited qualities whatsoever. And um, everything could be conditioned due to social environment. So what are emotions then, right? So emotions are actually internal beha behavioral responses. So it's an implicit behavior. And we could see this, uh, we have the overt responses that happen. So if someone is given a compliment, they might blush. That would be uh, the rosy cheeks might be a behavioral response to an internal trigger. Um, James's concept of emotions as conscious perception, uh, well, Watson didn't agree with that, right? Watson felt everything uh, was due to the environment, so not due to some conscious perception. All right, so what are emotions according to Watson? It's an objective stimulus situation that results in an overt bodily response which causes internal physiological responses. So fear might be learned or um, unlearned. Sometimes it's conditioned, sometimes it's not conditioned, but it could occur as a function of feeling like we're gonna fall or a loud noise. Love could be a function of being caressed or held and rage could be uh, a function of being restricted. Now, the Little Albert study is probably one of the more famous studies people know. Uh, this uh, study was never successfully replicated. Uh, actually, there is some argument that it was unethical, uh, but this was pre-institutional review board. Now, what, what uh, Watson did was he demonstrated that you could condition fear. Now, was he actually interested in conditioning fear? The answer is no. But he wanted to demonstrate, just like you could learn from the environment to become afraid of something, you could also unlearn the fear. And ultimately, uh, what he found was that uh, little Albert became afraid of a lot of different things. He became afraid of the white rat, which was conditioned, but anything that was similar to the white rat which was furry or fuzzy, he also became afraid of. So here's Watson wearing a Santa Claus mask, not a very good picture, um, but uh, little Albert becomes afraid of it. Now, who solves the mystery though? Well, Mary Cover Jones. Mary Cover Jones finishes the work that Watson tried to do, which was to teach that just like you can condition fear, you could decondition fear. And she worked with a person who was given the name, the fake name Peter, who was afraid of rabbits. And eventually she used systematic desensitization and helped Peter become um, less afraid of the rabbit. So what did she do? She gradually brought the rabbit closer and closer to the person. Eventually, Peter could touch and pet the rabbit without any fear. And also any of the condition or ge stimulus generalizations that happened also diminished and disappeared. Now, what is thought? So thought, according to Watson, was implicit motor behavior uh, or was reduced to subvocal thinking. So some of the criticisms, again, um, one criticism is that uh, he ignored concepts such as sensation and perception. So William McDougall um, argued that we had instincts or innate tendencies and, and, and thought which drived our behavior. Uh, he supported free will um, which Watson didn't believe in free will, everything was preordained. Now, Watson and McDougall have a debate, um, and ultimately they agreed that behavior is a proper focus of psychology. However, consciousness also was necessary. 
So uh, he also challenged Watson's idea that behavior is fully preordained, right? Uh, the concept of determinism, McDougal believed in free will, and uh, he criticized Watson's verbal report method because it was inconsistent. And that is part one of our lecture. So let's stop here. And uh, next week we'll talk about people like Skinner, uh, which is, you know, bringing us to the current as it relates to behaviorism.